Good afternoon. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy holidays to everyone. Thank you so much for being out on uh, this holiday weekend and on a Saturday afternoon when you can be anywhere, but you've chosen to be here with us. And we're very, very happy that you're with us this afternoon. And uh, I have the distinguished honor of introducing and presenting to others the artist Nate Young. And Nate is now a Chicago-based artist, but he's originally from Minneapolis. And he uh, got his BA from Northwestern College in Minneapolis and his MFA from California Institute of the Arts and he attended the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture, which is a pretty big deal. And uh, he has exhibited everywhere, different institutions, most notably places like the Harlem Studio Museum of Harlem, which many of us may have some knowledge of. And currently, he is a Chicagoan, because since 2016, he has been teaching as an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago over the Studio Arts Program. And he is currently represented by Monique Maloche, which is a Chicago gallery based in West Town. So without further ado, I'd like to present you Nate Young. Awesome, thank you, Danny. You're welcome. So uh, we both would like to thank uh, the Stony Island Arts Bank and the Rebuild Foundation for inviting both of us out to celebrate as we near the end of this fantastic uh, exhibition, In the Absence of Light, Gesture, Human, Humor, and Resistance in the Black Aesthetic. And it has been curated by, uh, co-curated by very own Theaster Gates. And uh, this is the collection of Beth uh, Rudin Dewitty. And um, Beth is a very active member in the art world and uh, avid collector. And she's known for having an incredible eye and spotting talent very early. And many of the people who she's collected throughout the years have gone on to be not only commercial stars, but critically acclaimed stars within this art world. So we're very grateful to have this collection here. I believe that the exhibition ends January 5th. So we're counting down the days. So again, it's so great to see you all here as we talk a little bit about it and have an even deeper conversation with one of the artists that is featured in this show, Nate Young. Uh, and it's really great that we have an artist here so you can actually ask questions about their work. I'm sure after um, this time is over, this more formal time is over, you'll be able to go to the other room, which is right behind us, where his piece is featured, which is called Altar Number 12. One of the altars. <laughs> so he has a series of altars we're going to get into, and I have my cheat sheet to make sure I'm accurate with my numbers here. Yes, it's Altar Number 12. Yeah, they're just like, uh, it's just the, sequentially... Yeah. Titled so the first one was altar number one and the second gotcha. one was two and three and four and five and I can't tell anymore by looking at them which number they are. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. So twelve sounds good. Yeah, it's it's number twelve. Do you know how many you've made so far in this maybe series? Maybe thirty or so. Thirty. Okay, so that's close to the halfway mark, which yeah, is the piece that we like have, that. which means it's really significant in the series and line of work. So we'll talk about a little bit about that piece along with um, this exhibition. And we'll start off with that. Initially, we wanted to do a kind of guided tour, but um, we've had such an overwhelmingly positive response uh, that we have a little bit, maybe too many people to try to take you all on a tour. So I'm gonna point out some pieces here um, between um, both Nate and I, and we'll talk a little bit about it, and then we'll talk about some other things. Uh, so, directly behind us is a piece by Lynette Yodamboache, who is a British Ghanaian artist, and she is critically and commercially acclaimed, and one of the most celebrated artists of our time who deals with the figure. And basically what I mean by figurative works is, to be literal, just the body 
and um, particular, all of, particularly the black body, all of her images are composite images of different um, drawings, photographs, of different people that she kind of creates into one person. So these are not literal portraits, meaning they're not used, they're not created with the sitter in front of her or one photograph. It's a composite of several different images, sometimes memories, sometimes ideas of different people, which makes her work incredibly compelling. One of the most compelling attributes of this exhibition is that it deals with something, uh, and you'll see in the curatorial statement, uh, about black interiority. And what that means is it deals with the spiritual, intellectual, creative mind, and anything else dealing with what goes on the inside. Sometimes it's trauma, sometimes it's joy, all of those things that make us human. And there's been a history in which those images were not available to us, and they were not circulated um, within the canon of art, and then also within pop culture as far as advertisement. So what makes this exhibition so important is that these are all art works done with the autonomy of black artists, meaning they have control over their image, how they want to be seen and shown and viewed. So this particular uh, image here, we can just take a look at it. And I believe this one was done in 2018. And all of her works just have a void background. So it forces you to focus on the subject, the person in the painting, particularly you just kind of are drawn up to his face. And it asks questions that are questions we would ask of humanity. What are you thinking? Not what are you selling? Not how much are you worth? Not how much labor can you contribute through your body? But what are you thinking? What's on your mind? What has your life experience shown you? What are you contemplating? Those are the questions that many of these works bring to the fore. And Lynette's uh, series of work, which pretty much all has the same type of format of a void background with one singular uh, figure in the front, really brings these conversations to the forefront. And uh, it's something to think about. And then to this side over here, to the right, well, my right, we have um, Taylor, Henry Taylor. And this one, I'm going to cheat, it's about that they be dangerous. Uh, and I have another one more in here, so I can make sure I don't mess up. Over 40 pieces in the show. Yes, I'm not dangerous, uh, which is an incredible on the canvas. And this one was done in 2015. Henry Taylor, who is a mid-career artist who's actually been doing this for some time, has also had a lot of acclaim within the last five years. With his abstraction of the figure, the less detail brings us to a more emotional part. And we see this young male figure, which is a boy holding a gun with the title, which actually is very profound on that. And it leads again to several conversations. Uh, and we can kind of go all around the room. Uh, lastly, if we can all turn our necks backwards, to the Nick Cave piece, which I think is a very salient piece in this exhibition. It stands out quite a bit. Um, this one is one that's not literally, it doesn't literally have a body, but it refers to the body. It refers to the presence and the life and the experience of something that's considered black and cultural. And also it has many political implications. So we have the gold, the jewelry, what, what are things worth? how things are covered up. And then it's also a kind of cheeky, uh, tongue-in-cheek example of that, just selling something on the street and you open it up and all this, you know, you'll raise inside it. Uh, so it gives you a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of a chuckle with it, but there's some very serious um, conversations going on as well. And how we're able to gesture, and how we look at this as a gesture of the body without the body even being present. So as we go around the room and as you all look around, several pieces in the show. Um, outside, there's a piece by Hank Willis Thomas, which is a photograph of two um, figures, a mother and a daughter, uh, both with these kind of halo-like afros. And I believe it's from an Afro-Shane advertising. 
Payne Willis Thomas did a series of work called Unran, where he stripped all of the literature and um, all of the selling and, and typeface of an advertisement away from the image of the 70s and early 80s. And he just left us with the images to contemplate. So that is an image to sell something, to market to a certain group of people, meaning us. And uh, some of those images are very powerful without something like Virginia Slims or malt liquor or lotion or Afro sheen. And he wanted to see what the images do when they're unbranded. How are we outside of capitalism, outside of materialism, outside of consumerism? How much have we placed our worth in that and other people's worth as well? And once that's stripped away, what are we left with? So that's one of the conversations. It's a small image, it's close to the exit door, so that's something you might want to contemplate and take a look at on your way out. Carrie James Marshall is a central image right behind us here. That should be a name that's pretty known to a lot of us. He's also a Chicago based artist. Uh, I don't want to say mid career, he might say late career. <laughs> Um, but he is the preeminent head of attraction in the art world at large, not just the black art world. He, he sold a piece, uh, he sold it for $25 million, uh, last year, was it? Uh, something like that, and, and it was bought by he did it, uh, which was a major move. Um, it's kind of hard not to talk about numbers and sales when we're having a conversation about the importance of black art and where it might go in the future, uh, especially works that deal with black interiority. Um, that's something that Carrie James Marshall has dealt with his entire life and working um, with the figure. So um, it's great that we have some of his pieces. And then I think I said finally, once before, truly finally, um, throughout this collection, you'll see works from the continent. Um, works by Elijah Swede, works by Citadel. These are African, Ghanaian, and Senegalese artists who have contributed to the overall blackness conversation and this idea of multicultural blackness, which I think is very important for us to think about outside of an African American bubble, outside of a black American bubble, how many nations, many countries, many ethnicities within this realm of blackness are looking at the political and social significance of this term and applying it to themselves over tribalism, over nationalism. Many people outside of this nation or outside of the Western Hemisphere are identifying as black first. That's very important to think about the Latinx um, communities who are coming forward within their own histories and understanding and refuting colonialism, as well as someone refuting colonialism, such as Civide, who was uh, Lenny Civide, who you'll see in some of these small images on this back wall. Uh, amazing uh, different genre scenes of uh, different Senegalese people um, engaging in genre, and which genre just means general, everyday life. I like to use that rather than the nap, but that's just me. All right. <laughs> so that's a very brief, um, hopefully concise enough overview, and we'll leave it open for questions. But since we have Nate here, <laughs> uh, I specifically pointed out um, works that are figurative. And again, that's the works that have a body in it, a person in it, a narrative that's assigned to um, someone's existence that's captured primarily on canvas, or on paper, in a portrait type situation. Nate doesn't do that, uh, which is really important for us to kind of, well, you might do that. I don't want to, okay. But <laughs> maybe his so, current maybe series someday. of work is, yeah, his current series of work uh, does not focus on that. However, his series of work critically focuses on um, narratives, history, memory, spirituality, sacredness, and what's, con what's considered sacred, and how he uses different mediums to promote uh, different feelings. Uh, and that's something we want to talk about. So if you can tell us a little bit about the current series that you've been working on, um, at least since 2016, if not earlier, um, which is a piece that's back there, which you'll see an altar piece, which again, I urge you to go and take a look. If you can tell us how that started, and um, yeah, we'll start from there. You want me to talk specifically about that piece? 
or that body of work. I can do Let's that. talk about the body of work and then we can go to that piece. Specifically. Yeah, I mean, this piece is a, I mean, uh, the piece that's in the show is from a, from a body of work that started, um, it, well, it really, it started with this little drawing that I made that was a drawing uh, that was just a text. And the text was from the Bible. And the, and the text was from this, uh, I think it's from First John. Mm -hmm. No, or John 1.1. 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I just took that text and I, I, I drew it in large, just like, but made it look like a, you know, like a typeface. Uh, so it's more like a drawing. And then above that text, there's, a, there's another drawing that's like a, it's just a square, a black graphite square. And I originally was thinking about that text because uh, I was thinking about the potential interpretations of that text. Because the only thing that I changed when I drew the text was that I capitalized the word word because I wanted to think about the potential that uh, the word word would stand in for like language in general. So that potentially you could interpret this text as saying that in the beginning was language and language was God, uh, potentially. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is because I had been thinking about um, this text by this French semiotician named Ferdinand de Saussure, who was, is kind of, he's Derrida's teacher and, um, and Foucault's teacher, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he kind of is the predecessor to a lot of postmodernist and post-structuralist writing, and he proposed yeah, he, and for not, he proposed that uh, what is at the basis of cognition, like the way that we know that we exist is through language. Um, but at the, so at the same time, I wanted to have these two potential interpretations of that text, that the, in the beginning there's God as a creator, and then in the beginning there's like this awareness of our own cognition. That's where that started, that piece. So it evolved over time into me thinking about, um, in that book by Saussure, there were, a series, uh, there were a series of diagrams that explained some of his ideas about semiotic theory. And what I was doing shortly after that drawing, I moved on to making these drawings that were all kind of diagrammatic uh, drawings where I was removing all of the language from those diagrams that were explaining these complicated theories about, um, about language and the way that we understand signification and just presenting the, 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 the diagram as a drawing, like a circle and a line and an arrow. Uh, because I wanted to think about what, um, like if something could be communicated w without language, what that would look like potentially because uh, in, in my thinking, I was like, if, uh, if language is the foundation of cognition, like how could we have a conversation potentially without using language? What, what would that kind of conversation look like? So, I mean, that's a little bit of background behind, yeah. behind that particular piece. I want to I wanna unpack that word language. So are you saying like a verbal language or a written language? Or I think... Within, I think art is a pictorial language within itself. Um, and you know, even the diagram and the, the forms that you composite together uh, serve as a language. Mm -hmm. um, so are you saying, what is it out without this spoken or written language? Yeah, or? I'm talking really literally about okay. the kind of language like that we're using right now in right. dialogue, like sp speech, written language, right. uh, utterances, uh, processes mm -hmm. of signification that use words yeah. to point to objects and ideas. Uh, so, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you, that you <laughs> talk about this other way of thinking about language, like vis visual language. Um, I'm, in, in my work, a lot of what I'm doing is trying to point to larger ideas using visual cues that are seemingly familiar. For mm -hmm. instance, like the altar piece yeah. is this thing that opens up. Right. It refers to uh, some kind of spiritual act. Right. It refers to the architecture of the church. It refers to the history of painting, triptych paintings where you have the, what you, the birth, yeah. the death, and the resurrection That's right. of, the, of the Messiah. Right. Um, but all of those things communicate something without using 
like words, right. you know what I mean? There's like a sense that you have in front of an object that you might not be able to articulate in words, but there are references in your experience, in your life experience, that help you understand uh, and process what you're, what you're seeing. Right, you know? right. I think that's the task, well, I, I would say that's the task of a great artist in order to bring a language to, through an object that is not spoken or written or uttered or, um, you know, through this, like even music is a certain type of language, a certain type of performance that conveys a message. Mm -hmm. And um, if we can look back at some of the, the uh, beginnings of this particular series and talk about how it came about, the, the narrative of your great-grandfather or great-great? Oh, yeah. The great, yeah. Your great-grandfather. And just as to give you a little bit, of a, little bit about it is he's, he's kinda, he had this conversation with his grandmother and it informed him quite a bit about his ancestry and his lineage and the line of people that he comes from. And he started to make a body of work that, that was in conversation with that. And if you can tell us a bit about that. Yeah, it's a really long story. Uh, uh, an abridged version. Uh, the abridged version. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, what, what Danny's referring to is another body of work uh, separate from from the piece that's in the in the show here, but in I mean, I, 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 yeah, I'm always thinking about similar kinds of ideas. For right. me and my work, it's it's usually uh, the same. The work is usually asking, or at least in, I'm asking the same body or series of questions yeah, in my work, and then using different materials and right. and ideas to get to some of those questions. Anyway, this work that I'm working on right now. Um, has to do with the history of some, some f particular personal familial history. Uh, so how do I abridge this? My great-grandfather <laughs> migrated from North Carolina to the Philadelphia area in this town called Ardmore. Um, and uh, this was in the, the early stages of the Great Migration, so early, maybe 1915, 1919, mm -hmm. somewhere. Sure. Or, first wave. Yeah, first wave Great Migration. and. Um, my grandmother didn't know that much about who he was before he arrived, but apparently she was, she presumed that he had had a whole other identity, like another, another name, another family potentially, uh, and that he had left under some kind of duress. Like he had to leave in her, she said they were trying to get him. You know, you know what that means. Yeah, uh, you know what that means. So, um, but I, but, you know, she told me this story in 2006, and later on, probably I think around 2016 was when I started working on this body of work. I started to think about uh, that absence of identity. I was, I'm, I was really interested in the space between when he leaves and when he arrives. That he had, there was an identity post flight, and in an identity post-arrival, and in between those identities, maybe there's some kind of void. Mm. Um, and then, mm. you know, I was like, well, if there's a void, how do we project into the void? And how, what kind of ideas could come out of the void? Right. You know, the absence of all things, I was thinking about that as the ultimate space for the creation. Yeah. Uh, or for potential creation. So there's that, and then there's this other part of the story where there's a horse, and he buried the horse, and then much later on, I figured out the location of the burial, and then I exhumed the body of the horse, and I have the bones, and I was thinking about bones as like a divining object, that like if you could toss the bones on the ground, you might be able to read the bones and come up with some kind of divine knowledge. Uh, there's that, and then, you know, there's some other weird stuff yeah, like that too. Yeah, I love it. I think it's, because it's quite anthropological. You got to digging, and. Literally and figuratively. And yeah, and I'm about to buy a horse now. Oh. I don't know if I told you that. No, you didn't tell me that part. <laughs> <laughs> Nate and I had a fantastic meeting a couple of days ago, um, which was about four hours. So this won't be that long. Um, so we can get more acquainted. But I'm with buying a horse, and I'm going to ride it from North Carolina to, to, to Philadelphia uh, in a couple of years. How did that miss our conversation the other day? I don't know. I forgot about That's it. That's a pretty big. <laughs> that would have changed. I would have had a, prepared a totally different list of questions, but that's okay. Anyway, um, that's amazing. Um, yeah. And I'm 
that's something to do with this idea of jockey and the, the history of black jockeys. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of a parallel story um, that I brought into some of the work just because it happens around the same time. Mm -hmm. And there, I mean, some of you might or might not be familiar with the history of black jockeys in the United States. In the early, late 1800s into the early 1900s, um, black jockeys dominated the sport of horse racing. They were like super prolific and like, they were the first superstar black athletes in America. Right. Uh, they started making money, and then they were really quickly forced out of the sport. Like, essentially, they just banned them from the tracks, and they weren't allowed to race anymore. Uh, yeah. So th that history, because of the horse, well, there's another part of the story. See, I told you it's a long story. It's OK. We have time. There's another part of the story where my grandfather, essentially the reason I want to buy a horse and ride the horse from North Carolina to Ardmore is because my great-grandfather rode on a horse right. in his you know, fugal state yeah. from uh, you know, North Carolina to Philadelphia. Wow. And so there's this relationship to the horse. And then there's the idea that the, the black jockeys were really dominant in the sport because they had a relationship with the horses. And this, you know, I mean, if you think about it, like it, it makes sense that uh, the people who would have the closest relationship to the horses in Kentucky were the people who were tasked with tending the stables. And these were, you know, uh, former slaves and children of former slaves. Um, so there's that parallel. Yeah. So I started, you know, thinking about that history as a parallel history to one of my own you know, ancestral. That's fantastic. And within the conversation of black imagery um, in a historic and even a modern contemporary sense, within visual culture, we can't miss the fact to discuss the lawn jockey as an object. So many of us might know the 20th century convention of placing a black-faced lawn jockey, often within a red riding coat, within your garden, holding a lamppost, which freezes that person within a specific place of labor, within a specific designation of dehumanization and servitude to a master, not only a master person, but a master narrative, a narrative that's bigger than they are to kind of oppress and send out and deploy these objects, which silently, as a language, say quite a bit. And um, I know I grew up in, in pretty much a predominantly black city and historically black people love, that I know, culturally love, uh, what's it, uh, landscaping. I can even tell a home that's a black home that's landscaped versus a non-black home. It's something a little bit, little bit of extra that I can relate to. You know what I'm talking about when you see it. And within my neighborhoods growing up, I would see someone who bought a black lawn jockey, jockey and painted it white. <laughs> as a contestation against that, made, that master narrative and as in reversing that story of um, subjugation. So I just wanted to add that, you know, like all of these different works, especially Nate's who we're talking about, are charged with so many stories and thoughts and ideas that go beyond um, what we might be able to think of within the five or ten minutes we might have a chance to view them. So I want us to think of those things. Um, as an art historian, I kind of have to throw that kind of stuff in. The, the lawn jockey is a funny thing, because before yeah. I found out about the history of black jockeys, before I started doing more research into that, I had no idea, like, why is it a jockey? Right. You, I mean, I knew it was like this Because they didn't have them on a horse, right? They yeah. were just a guy holding a lamp. But still, lamp. Yeah. I, I knew it was a, I knew they were jockeys, okay. right? But I didn't know what the history of that comes from. But that's directly linked to the history of black jockeys. That's yes. why you... That's where those come from. But it's funny because the history of the, the domination of black people in the sport is kind of, uh, you know, buried. It's kind of a, it's not like a very well-known history, but you see the jockeys. And it's sort of, it's almost like a kind of floating signifier because right. it's totally removed from the context of where it comes. I never thought about, I hadn't thought about that until you mentioned it just now, but that's You're welcome. interesting. <laughs> Uh-oh. Right. Do I anyway. see a new body of work brewing, no, like I, coming from, hey, okay, we'll talk about rights later, yeah. but um, <laughs> <in Boston. laughs> um, so 
the piece that's in the back, I hate that I keep referring to it and we can't quite see it, but all of that will be solved at the end of this because I know everyone's gonna make a rush to see it. it's within that next room right behind us. Uh, just to describe it uh, is a drawing on um, paper, um, which consists of a really important medium so I want to talk about that because I believe it connects directly with what you just spoke of with the bones and this kind of anthropological artistic practice that you've been working in. Which medium are you referring to? The dirt. Oh, um, well, that one's graphite on okay. paper. And, okay. then, and, then, and then it's wood, so it's... Uh, that one's different. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking of the one with the, the dirt from... The bones. Yeah. Oh, with okay. So we're back to that original yeah. piece. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. Okay. You even... To, I'm sorry. I stepped over it. He included the dirt from the excavation? That was a really specific dirt. Okay. So that, that's a different piece, too. So there's a series of drawings that I made okay. um, with images of bones in them. And then... Yeah. The, over uh, on the t on top of that, there's another drawing that's made with dirt. That dirt I got from uh, Richmond, Virginia, where uh, in the again in the early 1900s, first wave Great Migration, people were moving north on the train mostly, and in Richmond, Virgin Virginia, they were dr they were building a train tunnel through the city so that the train wouldn't have to go around the city. It was like a sh shorter cut. They weren't quite finished with the construction, but they were running trains through and the train, uh, the tunnel collapsed and it collapsed on the back end of the train and there were people trapped down there. And um, you know, I, when I was in Richmond, I talked to some people. Some people said there were different accounts of the story, but there was upwards of 150 people trapped in the back end of this train, which would have been the, the, you know, the colored section of the train. And they tried to dig, like, dig the tunnel up, and it started to collapse more. So they just sealed it. And it's still sealed to this day. So I was in Richmond, and I went and got some dirt from the site of the train tunnel collapse to uh, make a drawing. Just, it was just, a little just bit. went to Richmond and got some dirt. And yeah, I was there already. Yeah. But, That's um, fantastic. So yeah. I'm glad that we're linking all these things together, because even though they're different pieces, in perhaps even different series, there's this through line yeah. uh, that's a major connecting um, aspect as a trajectory of the practice that you're doing, which is about memory, not only a personal memory, but activating histories that are not usually told and not necessarily reframing them in this modern sense or this revisionist um, fa uh, fabulation, but, but bringing out aspects that are based in the real and they're very literal. Yeah, I mean, I would say, one of the threads, like one of the words that I've been using to describe more broadly what I've been thinking about in the work, and that relates to the piece that's here, and also this other work that we've been talking about that has to do with the history of my great grandfather and his migration and whatnot, and, uh, is is ritual. So the dirt for me was like a ritual act uh, to to get the specific dirt from the specific place that might have a memory in and of itself and, and to manipulate that material um, was similar to me to thinking about like casting, casting lots or rolling bones on the ground and then divining knowledge through those and is similar also to uh, the aesthetic that I'm trying to get to in the piece that's here, like that the altar is a kind of um, uh, authoritative structure that uh, the spiritual, the vision, because it visually looks like something that comes from a church or something that's contemplative or something that also is kind of secretive mm -hmm. and ethereal, mm -hmm. uh, that there might be some kind of deeper meaning behind it. Uh, but I'm most interested in, in, in how that, how one could even recognize that in an object. Like yeah. what is it in an object that makes it look like it has a kind of uh, religious or ritual or spiritual or um, supernatural power? Which brings me back to the conversation we had uh, the other day, which came first, uh, this kind of chicken or the egg conversation we had with the idea of does imagery evoke a certain idea of I don't know, could be romance, could be joy, could be religiosity, whatever, or 
uh, spiritualism, whatever it could be, or does imagery come from the maker who's feeling these things? For instance, if you look at something like the Sistine Chapel, which we're all pretty much familiar with, is that something that is designed to uh, promote a sense of the sacred, the spiritual, the divine, uh, perhaps even the supernatural, or is it out of all of those things, the sacred, the divine, the spiritual, that those types of works are produced? Which one comes first? It works in both directions. I mean, one of the things that, one of the ways that I would describe uh, the altar, the series of altars, is that one, one of the things that um, is kind of inspiring that work or, uh, is thinking about uh, the aesthetic of, of, the, of the church. And that in the early European church, the, the, um, the congregation is predominantly illiterate. So they can understand the stories in the Bible either through the oration of the priest or the pictorial uh, imagery that exists in the church. And so if you want to convince someone that God exists, you can't have no rinky-dink looking, drawing. That shit has to look like super, you know, convincing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. At the same time, I think that once one is convinced of a kind of belief system, That's you right. pay homage to it and treat the, the objects and the images and the stories in a, in a way that's sacred. So I, but this kind of contradiction of not knowing which comes first is really compelling to me. Yeah. I mean, we talked in the studio about like, yeah. I mean, you were asking me what kind of questions I'm asking myself or what kind of questions do I think the work proposes. And it's always, I'm always thinking about a question that doesn't have an answer. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm most compelled by um, things that seem kind of paradoxical. That's right. Uh, and, and, you know, the chicken and the egg is the yeah. uh, proto-paradox of yeah, yeah. Western thought, I Absolutely. guess, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with the piece, um, to describe it, it is, you'll see it's what it's called an altar, and it's framed by this fantastic wood framing uh, that appears as almost two doors or shutters that frame the image and that can be closed. I don't encourage you to touch it and close it, but uh, it is something that moves. We can take a look. But in the center is, uh, to use a word that you used early, is this representation of a void, um, which is aligned with this idea of blackness, even though it's on a gray scale. Uh, this in the center that just will draw you in. And when I looked at this piece that's in the back room, I looked at it as this kind of portal that was, at, the longer I stared at it, I felt that it might have the, the power to transport me somewhere. If it's not to a certain place, it's into, most importantly, into someone else's mind. Or then again, someone else's narrative, um, which is what this show seeks to serve, to transport us all into not only our collective narratives, but into these individual narratives that we may or may not know. Um, and maybe that's something you can talk a little bit about with that particular altar piece and this series of altars in general. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 when I was making those drawings, uh, the ones that are in the altars, I was always thinking about them as drawings of nothing. Mm. Um, drawings of absence. So the void is an apt term to use to describe what the, the image is because it's not an image of something. At the same time, it does look spatial. Yeah. You know, but it, in that in relationship to the idea of excavating the text from the diagram or the diagrammatic marks or mm -hmm. the, the, the graphs that explain ideas, so like removing the ideas from those, the, the diagrams actually also become a void in a way. That's right. Uh, I also talk about them as frameworks or uh, scaffolds, um, like architectural scaffolds, yeah. metaphorically at least, for that the diagram is actually a framework that the, that the idea rests on top of. And without the scaffold or the framework that the ideas might fall down. Collapse, yeah. Um, wow. So yeah, there, there are a lot of different kinds of voids that I'm thinking about, like the void of my grandfather's identity, the void 
actual, like, how, what, what does a void look like? How do you make an image of a void? It's actually not possible. Right. Um, the void because of, it's a void. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting. This is That's a, my attempt. Though. It's a perfect segue because I started off talking about the idea of voids, just to refresh our visual vocabulary. If you need to see something that's resembling a void or imaging a void, that's in this piece here where it's this kind of shaded nothingness where it leaves two things open. It leaves this exploration of what is nothing and all these wonderful questions that might be a little bit too heady for Saturday afternoon. But also it allows us, for people like me, just to say, okay, what can be there? What, uh, what is the future of there? What is optimistic or what has been there in a more pessimistic side? Like, you know, different ways we can pull out and extract from this void that represents kind of everything and nothing at the same time, which goes with that paradoxical contradiction that we spoke of, of the chicken and the egg. Um, which we have a, a little bit of time left um, since we're not going to do the major um, tour. So for within the next... Should we uh, open it up? Hmm? Open it up? Yeah, well, for the next 10 minutes before we open it up. Um, you're not about the hot seat. Oh, yet. really? No. I thought the, the Q&A is the <laughs> real hot seat. We're good. Seat. It's not that. No, we're good. We just want to talk about um, some kind of general things uh, that we spoke of the other day and this idea that this show, why it's so important and I think we all, many of us who are here because we can all feel this, this presence of the, the importance of black visual art within this moment. Um, I mentioned a very high stakes sale of a blue chip piece at an auction um, that was created by a black uh, artist and then also bought at an auction by a black artist. Um, and with social media, um, several platforms promoting images where the average household might know names that they may not know before. And they have a certain access to artists and these creatives. Uh, it, this is a really, really, uh, it's an amazing time um, for this period. Uh, a lot of people are interested in collecting art as, as an investment or as maybe an extension of a hobby. And they're asking questions that they never asked before, primarily because um, they see more and more art that they're interested in now. Um, so that's something, as we open up the floor, those types of questions are more and more welcome. Um, we can discuss those. Uh, but Nate and I were talking about, um, I, I, I think every artist, and also those who are art adjacent, such as writers and historians and critics and curators, are a little bit nervous of the frenzy um, of black art at this moment, because where there's a frenzy, often alludes to there'll be a decline, or there'll be a lessening of a attraction, or there'll be a lessening of a trend. And that's more associated with the commercial market of going up and down, which is what's going to happen, um, inevitably. Um, we don't know exactly how long um, this particular wave will go. We've seen it before in the 90s, um, with artists who are in this show, such as Glenn Ligon um, and others, uh, who started around that time, and, and then we see kind of their, their social currency starts to dissipate a bit throughout the years, and then with social media, again, throwing these images out um, quite a bit to us, and we are able to consume them and, and analyze them and think about them in ways that we had not thought about before, they have a new relevance and a new importance to us. So um, spaces like this that show this type of work within a neighborhood that's like this, that represents people who live here, who are from here. We have artists from Chicago, um, um, Nathaniel Mary Quinn, um, who is a, a prominent artist as well who is a Chicagoan who has a very interesting story of growing up in a certain neighborhood in the city. So we, we thought a lot about how, how it's important to kind of secure the legacy and the future of black creators um, in many different mediums, and particularly here we're talking about visual art. Um, so one thing that we talked about is there's been this high interest in figurative works, art that you can see yourself in quickly. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, that's not the work of quite a few artists who are 
making work right now, such as Taquase Dyson, who's another Chicago artist, Simone, uh, Simone Lay deals with the figure. But then here we have such a great opportunity with Nate Young, who deals with things outside of bodily representations, um, which may not look like this beautiful, highly melanated figure riding a horse that we are getting so attracted to. <laughs> so um, what are some of the things that you think young artists should keep in mind, and we talked about this, um, as far as when the world is closing these doors and the, the in New York Times isn't writing about it as much and maybe they're having a hard time finding a, a gallery selling them because something else that's super hot right now is on the market. What do you think is the most important thing to keep in mind as an art who, artist who creates? I don't know, man. I'm saying <laughs> like, uh, don't ask me, because I'm not, I'm not, I mean, Look, the, the, the work that I make, I don't care if it's going to be popular or not popular. It seems to me like right now the, the trend says black figuration is hot. Um, you know, the, it's just not necessarily what I'm interested in. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. The only fear I have is that uh, the institution, the market, whatever kind of qualifying systems uh, revolve around artistic art, art practices, that those things validate black figuration without critical analysis. That's right. And, and that may block the ability for black production to be critical That's right. because it's not encouraged necessarily yeah. through the things that validate and qualify. Uh, I say, you know what, get it while, get it while it's hot. <laughs> Don't be under any illusions that it's gonna stay hot. Uh, so if you're doing something because it's hot right now, I mean, I'm, when, it's not, when it's no longer hot, then what, what, what will you do? Right. <laughs> Right. So, I don't Which know. you're very humbly. This is what I would tell a young artists, yeah. you know, like, get it while it's hot or just do what you got to do and don't worry about what's hot and what's not hot. They'll come back around. Maybe. Maybe not. I mean, I look at art, you look at artists like uh, Jack Whitten, whose work is across from mine in That's the right. other room, uh, or Charles Gaines. That's right. Uh, who only recently has, is being looked at. He's a black conceptualist. Like, hmm, what's that? Black conceptualism. Like, I'm talking about like 1960s conceptualism. Like, he's making work alongside Saul Lewitt and mm -hmm. jo Joseph Kasut and, right. and, you know, Adrian Piper, That's right. the other black conceptualist. Um, but, but these are people who had long careers and without a lot of attention. So, I'm, I'm really, you know, the art world is going to do what it's going to do. Yeah. It's maybe, or, you know, I was at a, um, I was at a talk one time at Fred Moten, who's one of my uh, really um, one of my favorite writers, was asked what he would say to uh, young. He was asked the same question, like, "What do you say, to young black artists, like in the art world?" He was like, uh, "If there's a thing that's called the art world, I'm not really concerned about that world. I'm interested in like imagining other worlds, like ways that things could be, and living as if." that's the world that you're in. Like, if, there's a, if you have a problem with the, this world, then don't participate in that world. Just live in the world that you want to be in. I think that that's, wraps it up really okay, nicely. That, that question, <laughs> I mean, I think you really graciously said, I mean, of course, I would take the latter half of your statement of try to make work that's most important to you um, and not care. But at the same time, people Gotta have eat. to eat. People, you know, it's a shine out there that's hard to resist, um, especially with the younger artists. And, um, but I think the overall overarching statement is, even if you're doing what's incredibly attractive right now, keep in mind those other tenets of criticality, of doing what you love to help sustain you throughout the trendiness or without whatever type of adjective someone throws on this long-living, very culturally significant work that operates outside of all of these different opinions. One thing I would say is that for us to be as autonomous as possible with supporting our work, ourselves, our spaces, 
um, even within those who are allies within the community who are not necessarily representative of the community, but also work diligently with it, have a responsibility uh, to make sure spaces like this um, are appreciated, are respected, and are preserved because it's, it's a responsibility that no one else should have but those of us who are, who are of this community. Um, first, so I think that's really important. Lastly, I'm gonna ask you one last question and then we'll open it up. So you've been in Chicago since 2016, permanently. Well, your new move. About that. Yeah, and um, I was really happy that I told, his, his, his studio is out on the west side, like in the west side. And I was so happy that he kind of, without knowing, just kind of was gra gravitated to that space and activated that space with his very critical presence as an artist working within a, a community that embodies one of the largest numbers of black people within the city, which is culturally significant and awfully looked over and looked past and looked at negatively, to be honest. And here he is a, what he won't say, but I'll say a successful artist um, and a very important um, artist of this current moment. Um, and he has, taking up space in this place where other people would, even people who looked, looked just like us would drive right past and deem it not a place to be. And I think those are the type of activations we have to make and those type of political stances. And it was one of the most beautiful studios and spaces that I'm tempted to like kind of inhabit. Maybe I can get a corner <laughs> um, within your space. But how the question is, um, how has living in Chicago um, with over the last uh, four years almost, um, informed your studio practice and also then informed your body of work. Yeah, I, I knew you were gonna ask that. Good. <laughs> and I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's too early to yeah. know. I mean, I haven't sure. been here that long sure. and I'm still really trying to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, I like being in Garfield Park because it's, it's quiet. Yeah. Somehow. It's just, I, I feel a little bit more isolated over there because no, you know, at least people in the art world don't, nobody's around, so right. I kind of right. like it. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I don't know. I, I think it's just too early to tell. Okay. I, I figure it out in retrospect. Yeah, yeah. When, you know. Well, that makes sense. You deal a lot of, with memory, so maybe some years have to pass and you'll remember something. Yeah, I mean, I've always, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I went to school in LA and after yeah. after I was, when I was getting ready to graduate from Cal Arts, and I was moving back to Minneapolis, back to the Midwest, uh, one of my friends said to me, "You know, it was nice knowing you." Like as if the only places where human beings are allowed to live are New York or L.A. I'm like, come on, you know, there are ways to do interesting and creative and and things and things that push boundaries in the Midwest. So I moved from the Midwest to the Midwest, and I feel like I'm still. I still am of that mentality. I mean, yeah. look at where we're, look at where we are. I mean, right. This is, you know, what the Astor's doing yeah. is like taking something, not only that's the South Side of Chicago that people, do, you know, kind of move past or around or just don't go to in a place like Chicago where people are like, oh yeah, there's not really, really any, any art, you know, fly over. It's a, it's a layover to New York where the art is mm -hmm. and, and drawing attention to it. It's sort of like, you know, Field of Dreams or some shit like that. Yeah, yeah. If you build it, they will come. Exactly. So, exactly. I mean, and I've, 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 I've thought about, this is a way that I'm thinking before I come to Chicago, right? You know, I've been here for three years. I'm still kind of just hiding out and doing my, my own thing. For mm -hmm. When I was in Minneapolis for years, my wife and I ran a... a a project space there, and we did exhibitions. We did probably 20 exhibitions in five years. Incredible. Um, I moved to Chicago, I was thinking like, maybe I'll do something like that here, but right now I'm still like feeling it out and seeing what yeah. seems like the right thing oh. for Chicago and yeah. in Chicago. Well, yeah. I can assure anyway, you the opportunity will arise, yeah. even maybe before you're ready, so get ready. We'll be after you. And I'm just trying to figure out how to ride a horse, that's all. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You'll be surprised. There's somebody right here on the south side that can teach you that, uh, or on the west side for sure. Sure. I'm sure. for sure. I'm sure there's, there's some people who are willing and able to. Um, we got black cowboys. Oh, yeah, all of that. Yeah, it's here. You know, 
nickname of Up South is real. So mm -hmm. um, speaking of migration, that's great that you're here in one of these legendary migratory cities of that first and second and uh, in between waves mm -hmm. of migrations. Um, and uh, I think it's awesome since you just got here in 2016 that you reside in like one of the last spaces of that that migration, which mm -hmm. is the West Side. And uh, I can't thank you enough for being here. I hope everyone understands what a privilege it is to, to not only engage with all this work, but engage with one of its makers who's dedicated his life um, to, to creating works that not only, that aren't necessarily self-serving, but se serve a purpose that is far greater than not only himself personally, but also his lifetime. Um, in creating a legacy of, of objects that we will be in, engaging with and asking continued questions and further and further discovering ourselves. Um, so with that, we would like to open up the floor um, for any questions, even if it's something we haven't discussed. And I see Patrick, so please. So Patrick first, and then, uh, That's a good question. I mean, I think I, I don't I don't I don't know if I necessarily have the answer to this. Um, coincidentally, there's the the lawn jockey thing, which I think is a is kind of a pejorative image, right? Um, but I don't know if that comes after. I don't know if those come up at the time, you know, when black jockeys are. In their in their prime, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. The images that I've seen, the and in the images that I've seen reproduced of black jockeys, they look like they're being photographed the same way that the white jockeys are, you know, in their regalia and you know with the horses and whatnot. Yeah. I haven't seen other than the lawn jockeys. I haven't seen that kind of like pejorative uh, imagery being distributed in mass. I, but I don't know. That's a good question. If I can um, add a little bit to that, uh, I think you're absolutely right. Black lawn jockeys were often um, photographed the same way lawn jockeys were. But the, the designation of a lawn jockey, lawn jockey was not something that was glamorous in a sense. If you notice, if they talk about this time period, who gets the celebrity name? The horse. Right. Seabiscuit and other names, they, they kind of glamour. Still that way. Yeah, it's the horse that gets it. So if you look at the type of man that has to be a lawn jockey, it's usually one that's very petite, small in nature, certain stature. So there's a lot of conversations of masculinity and this prototype of idealism aesthetically that jockeys were kind of taken out of, both black and non-black alike. Um, and then I think when we get a lot of mentions of names of lawn jockeys, they're not the black ones, so to speak. But they are photographed, like you said, within all the regalia. So I think it's a conversation of um, how this, how the horses were just kind of glorified even more so than those who were, who were driving them, who were operating them. Yeah. Oh, you, and then, don't. Um, I, I can answer more, the, the dirt question pretty quick. Yeah. I, was, I was using the Take dirt to make drawings, essentially, uh, on paper, like rubbing dirt into paper. And I was thinking about trying to make portals, like if I rubbed it long enough that maybe it would open a portal. It didn't work. But I wanted, I wanted the image that was left over to look like there was a kind of action being done to it. 
Um, so um, your question was, what image would I choose that kind of embodies the future or maybe represents a certain uh, particular representation that I think might be the most important to look at or um, to end on? And not to avoid your question in any way, but quite honestly, I don't think there is one. I think my, within my practice as an art historian, I've been fighting against monolithic representations and not only as an art historian, just socially, um, and just kind of teasing out and unpacking this idea of so many different representations and variations within even your own street, you know? And I think there's this desire to kind of shorthand the identity of blackness into this one thing because there's so much of a collective identity that many of us can relate to, collective histories, but within those are these um, multivalent stories that, that, that um, are so important to kind of pull out. So when I look at something like the Derek Adams piece directly behind us here, which is talking about beauty shops and the stores, uh, beauty um, supply stores and the wigs um, that are sold, you know, something that you might see on Stony Island, you know, and, uh, and if you go to a salon, how you might see someone working on one of these mannequin heads or how you pick your style at, um, versus um, something where there's uh, again, talking more about this interiority, contemplation, this pensiveness, or again with Nate um, Young's work, which um, deals with these voids and, 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 and makes references to spirituality and, and further engages us in questions and, and with the object's natural um, state, such as wood and the mediums of drawing and paper. You know, all of those things are so incredibly important that it then becomes the collective, which is why I think an exhibition like this is to be viewed eventually as, as one body of work. Um, and you take out of it what you can, you, you, you digest it piece by piece, you come back and look at it, you spend 20 minutes here, maybe 10 minutes there, maybe you go home and watch a YouTube clip about this particular artist or you look to see what's been written about them. Um, it's an ongoing thing and I try to avoid that type of one um, image. I think that's such a great question, by the way, because I think what happens is these prototypes of what black art is and what should be come out and then that kind of directs maybe what the market should go by, what I should be collecting, no, or what I should be making, and it limits us. So I think there's such a huge expanse to what we can create, what we have done, and there's so many different layers um, within the stories of artists, um, within the works they create, um, within their own um, practices and the communities that are affected by them, who collect it, who show it, who curate it, however they engage with this work that it's, uh, the last thing I want you to do is look at one piece and say, this is it. So, that's me. Uh, Chelsea, where's she at? Yeah, there you are, you had a question, yeah. So, uh, like I said, this, it's, it, there's a long story. So part of what I left out in my abri abbreviated, abridged version <laughs> was that uh, when my grandmother told me about her father, my great-grandfather, uh, I think it was 2006, I, I, maybe 04, 05, something like that. And um, sh the conversation was stimulated because my older brother had found a box of photographs in her basement. And we started looking through the photographs she was telling stories about all of these people who were her cousins and uncles and you know brothers and sisters and we came to this photograph of her father my great grandfather and she was like you know so she tells me about where he was from and this and that but in the photograph he's standing next to a horse so later on i figured out that he had ridden that horse from somewhere in north carolina and i have a pretty good idea at this point to ardmore pennsylvania which is right outside of philadelphia and so and then later I found journals that belonged to him and those journals led me to the location of the, where he had buried the horse. He had buried the horse in order to hide the horse. Uh, so I've been doing a bunch of work using the bones of that horse. 
and I wanted to essentially embody his movement. So I recently applied for a grant to get some money to buy a horse, yes. and uh, that it seems like that's going to happen. That's that amazing. you know, I mean, I haven't done it yet, so I don't know what. Essentially, I like wanted to experience his movement from one place to another in my body with this animal. And it is about this animal intimacy because there was an intimacy that he developed with this horse that then he had to put down, you know, that then I later find and that I'm sort of in some ways developing intimacy with this animal, you know, removed from its life but through this sort of imagined rituals with the bones of that animal. So that's where, that's where I'm at. Man. Thanks. Any, any other questions? We have a bit more time. For, yes, sir. Yeah, the day that uh, Beth was here, yeah. she said when she was buying a lot of these paintings, she had no idea that the artist was black in the painting. And you know, with that in mind, even when I look at Nate's art, I don't immediately, I wouldn't immediately just assume that a That's black right. person made that. That's right. So, but with that in mind, like, I'd like to know what you two think that people are referring to, or even for yourself, when we use the term black aesthetic, what is it? You can't look at the work and like to someone like Beth, who's accepted as, you know, she has the eye, but she can't look at that work and it doesn't resonate in any way with blackness. <laughs> right. What are we talking about? Right, right, right. Yeah, what is a black aesthetic? I, sometimes it seems like maybe a little ob more obvious than other times. I, I don't know, I mean, that there is some kind of monolithic blackness that exists, I think is a, a, a very problematic idea. You know, I think that the expanse of the potential in production you know, by peoples of, from the diaspora is much more interesting to me than trying to pinpoint one thing that is blackness. Blackness is everything and all things and potentially can be this and could potentially can be that. And when you asked about like if there was one work that, uh, to point to, I'm like, well, I would rather point to something that's not even here. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I'll point to Leslie Hewitt or Stephanie Jemison or mm -hmm. Naima Morgan mm -hmm. or uh, Zavaria Simmons uh, or, you know, and so on. Um, go ahead. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, things are aesthetically, I, well, so for instance, the, the piece that I have, the altarpiece that's here, there is an aesthetic that I wanted to access in that work. It's not a pure abstraction, right? It looks like something that comes out of church, not necessarily even black church. It's more Catholicism, really. So I understand an image based on other images that I've seen before. So if I were to think about uh, something that was aesthetically black, it would have to be black in, to, in relationship to something that I've seen in the world before that I've associated with blackness. Uh, but I'm just a little bit hesitant about the idea that all black experience is the same experience. So if every individual person has a different experience, the potential for all kinds of experiences to come out in representation is very, very broad. Um, and then, I mean, not to mention the fact that part of what we're talking about is abstraction. I mean, look at those Jack Whitten paintings over there. You know, like, uh, those are black. I mean, Jack's black, but he's making abstract paintings. And am I supposed to know that he's black when I look at those paintings? I, I don't know. I don't, necessarily. It's not. That's not important to me. What's important to me is that uh, blackness, that people are given the opportunity to experiment in whatever way they think is important to them or whatever way is exciting to them and that that kind of practice is uh, patronized. I mean, that there are patrons for that practice so that people can keep making the work, you know, so that black women can keep making abstract paintings, you know, anyway. Yeah, I got a little bit off of your question, but I, the, my real answer to your question is I don't know. Um, I think the idea of looking at a work, um, especially, most importantly, with the living artist, 
and not engaging with the theoretical and perhaps social uh, or any other practices that they're using to, to um, imbue within their work, um, you have the opportunity to discuss these things with the artist. And I think that is a defining moment. So there's a lot of non-black artists who paint black images almost exclusively, right? So the question then becomes, oh, is this black art? You know, this is a non-black artist. You have to then have this kind of, and I wouldn't know who painted this. Was this a white artist or is this a black American artist, or is this a black American artist from a Chicago South Side, or is this a black uh, Ghanaian artist from um, an African culture that is the, this particular group is the descendant of, but may not have these direct connections of uh, cultural relevancy, re relevancy that they can uh, quickly relate to, right? There's all these different questions. Those questions simply have to be asked. So once those questions are asked, if you ask Nate about his work, if you read about the things he said about his work, if you talk about other um, scholars like Fred Moten who's, who have analyzed visual works or someone who's spoken about uh, art such as Thelma Golden when she was talking about post-black, all of these things are to try to, ca to try to categorize the practices and the intents of the creator. Art and the creator are autonomous. Now, we love it when they can syncretize and align themselves, but I've seen many intentions of an artist, and then I've seen the work, and they're in complete opposition of each other. So what I first go by to determine what's, what a black art is, is I speak to the artist and see what their intentions are and how they're bringing up um, significant barriers within what we consider the black cultural aesthetic. Um, which is wide and expansive. Also, um, I, just think it's that, I just think that's really the most important thing, um, to be in conversation. And someone like Jack Whitten, who has passed away, he talked about it a lot. Someone like Alma Thomas, who is an abstractionist, talked about it a lot. Different narratives, or the idea of, I'm making this pure, extract work as a black woman artist because they said I can't do it. Ah, isn't that a conversation within blackness? Isn't that a conversation within feminism? Isn't that a conversation against a certain political device that says you can't in oppress? So the aesthetic is one thing, right? And a lot of times curators and collectors only look at an aesthetic and it gets them in trouble. And I think it's important as we consume art, as we look at art, as we analyze art, that we look at both those intentions of the artist, both what the work might be doing, improve our analytical literacy, and then also see how it reflects to us. There's also that notion, how black it is often refers to how much I relate to it. There's many artists who are non-black that we've been able to relate to. I'm gonna use the music example as someone like Tina Marie. And you will have a hard time convincing someone that that's not a black artist because what she sung, how she sung, how it related to us, and who 98% of her fan base and who she related to as a person, as an artist, as a creator was. And what the art was doing itself. What was it pulling from? Was it pulling from R&B? Was it pulling from Afrocentric rhythm? So was it pulling from the centuries of, of jazz, of the blues, of the spiritual that's created our presence here in the States and abroad and around the world? It's a huge conversation. And I don't think we can be reductive to even think about pinpointing certain things of what is and what isn't. At the end of the day, it ends up being like the old folks would say, it is what it is. And it's an uncomfortable statement because it leaves you at unrest. And as we're here, we are to deal with that unrest, unpack it, reckon with it, and see what other questions we can have to further development, develop it. Like I love that Nate said, I don't know. And that is a purely legitimate answer. I think it's, that's the true. But I think one of the guiding things we should go by is again, these conversations, these intentions, the analysis of the work, what the work is doing. And because I'm gonna tell you something, I know a lot of work produced by black people that I don't consider black art. So I don't, I think we just have to have more broad conversations and, and think about it that way. I hope that answers really? your questions. It does. Sure. <laughs> huh. 
how far, well, how far back do you want to go? I think most, right. And like I meant, that's why I mentioned um, Jack Whitten posthumously because I think there are several artists who've had conversations. As, I mean, as early as uh, the Harlem Renaissance, as early as the 1900s, who've talked about it. Um, that's why the written work and the work that what I do and others do is so important to historicize it. And there's interviews and there's videos, many artists who are not here within the contemporary framework, not necessarily right now who are living, but I think the idea of black art of what we're talking about is a contemporary conversation. Um, it is one that starts primarily within the Western world within the 20th century. And pretty much we can talk about these pieces. Of course, there's tons of lesser known artists, a lot of um, intuitive artists who we didn't get a chance to have these conversations with, whose work is rising to more fame now that we may not be able to uncover, but a lot of times some of those things are more literal and we can see why it might align itself with a certain kind of blackness. But I think there's a lot of information out there um, that we can find out and it's available to us. And I think that's really a great question and it charges us to think, what is this black aesthetic? What did someone from the 1920s think about this? What did um, you know, sculptors and painters and performance artists um, think about this um, as these black creators before civil rights, post-civil rights, during Jim Crow, during, um, uh, during um, Reconstruction, um, this art goes that far back. So I think there's enough information out there to, answer, to start to answer these questions. But you don't believe me. <laughs> um, I, I personally don't, I wouldn't even use the, the term, I don't think, when we talk about black culture and black aesthetic, I think those are just problematic in and of themselves. I wouldn't really, I don't think there really is such a thing, because we can't even really truly define black or black. You know, when I look at, when I look at American art, right, or European art, there's so much that's undefined. There's so much that sits in this place that's in between, I don't know, Picasso's, uh, Madame de Avon, the, the image of uh, the, the, the prostitutes with African mask on, right? And it's Picasso, a European artist of Spanish descent, right? Who's, com just one moment, who's completely created this work based off of Afro, literally African work and Afrocentric ideas. And they put that under this category of European art. And if I look at this idea of American art or pop art, there are problems within all these labels. The problem, the, the, what we're trying to do is elevate it to the point there, hey, there's enough artists out here creating in a certain way who come from different experiences that have links to their past, links to their pre presence, that they have quite a bill quite a bit in common, even though there's all these things different, and there's a way to categorize this. It's not a perfect way, there never is. Um, I mean, you know, when I look at someone like Andy Warhol, who's considered this quintessential um, American artist, and a lot of the work he did was un-American. Um, and I don't, think we, I don't think we have to be that literal with us, and then give so many groups breaks. If we're going to celebrate art, if I'm going to go to uh, the Louvre, if I'm going to go to any of these places and celebrate art, I can find a way, problematic as it might be, reductive as it might be, to celebrate my own because unfortunately within language, as you mentioned, it has limits and we're trying to flesh that out. But I know if I say, see the words black art aesthetic, it's going to pull me into some pieces of work that I'm going to have a frame of reference for something that's going to relate in a, to me, not just as a person, but also my interest of art. And um, I think that's important. Well, I was just going to say, when you use the term black, when you use the term European, those are, you know, you're talking about, say, a continent or nationality. Right. But even European, that's true, but European art never associates itself with black Europeans. Right? The history of the European canon only deals with the subjugation of the black figure within the canvas or within sculpture. It never talks about the autonomy or the con contributions of blackness. So that's another question. That kind of reinforces the point I was making earlier. We talk about culture and aesthetic. If this is one thing I think there's a more solid kind of what we would call aesthetic or sound of black music. Mm. If you control the means of production, you don't have to get someone else's permission or approval or get resources from them to Oh, 
There's such a history of black musicians rap. having to get hit. We should rap after the talk some more. Yeah, there's so much history of the history of music production that came no. out of the permission of white labels, white owners. Right. Yeah, I it's mean, a, no, it's a, unfortunately, no, it's a never-ending conversation. I think, um, we can go on. I think uh, I just want to say one thing because I think uh, a good question to to add to your question is what is a white aesthetic? You know what I mean? If you're gonna if you're gonna ask one, you gotta ask the other. Ben, we should go over there. We got a, one last out of Ben. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you both for actually fantastic conversations. Both are friends of mine. Just, to, <laughs> just to, just to, uh, to you know, which, which is again, what to reiterate, reiterate the importance of um, not only this exhibition but places and spaces that allow uh, these types of conversations, um, which I've had an amazing time. Before we end officially, even though we'll say goodbye here, um, please take a look at Nate's work. I've talked a lot about it to kind of, you know, you know, make people really <laughs> run back there and take a look at it. And I believe you're gonna hang out a little bit. So if I'll be here for some people have um, some questions, you can directly ask him, which again is a really wonderful opportunity. I want to thank everyone here at Rebuild at the Stony Island Arts Bank. And please give a hand specifically for Nate. So, uh, thank you so and much. And thank you as well.